If you want to have some relatively happy travels with the Doctor, do yourself a favour and remember rule number one of travelling with him. The Doctor lies. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Who Culture, and here is Doctor Who, 10 Biggest Lies the Doctor Has Ever Told. Number 10. The Time Lords were the good guys. The Ninth and Tenth Doctors were the freshest faces who had to deal with the Time War, the loss of Gallifrey and the destruction of the Time Lords. They both chose to deal with this in different ways. For the Ninth Doctor, he was more likely to keep silent on the whole affair. He told Rose that he was the last of his kind, though that would be one of the last times he mentioned it. The Tenth Doctor, while not exactly starting conversations with it, was a little freer in speaking about it. He told Martha about Gallifrey, describing it as a beautiful paradise. He would go on to describe it to Wilf as well, telling the man about his people, how good and just they were, all while seeming to long for any way home. However, this turns out to be a romanticised version of the truth. When the Master successfully opens a portal to Gallifrey to break the time lock and return, the Tenth Doctor is terrified. His fantasy is shattered, knowing that the planet had descended into hell by the last day of the Time War. The Time Lords themselves had broken all of their sacred rules, throwing everything they had against the Dalek fleet. The Doctor may once have been correct about his people and their ways, though the race that tried to escape the war was a far cry from this dream. Number 9. Telling Sarah Jane that he would come back There was some contention over this one, as technically the Doctor never actually promises to return to see Sarah Jane Smith at the end of the Hand of Fear. With the events with Eldrad finished, Sarah Jane is so frustrated with the Doctor that she storms out of the control room, demanding to be taken home. None of this is meant to be serious, but while out of the room, the Doctor receives a telepathic summons from Gallifrey. I can't take Sarah Jane, he says to himself, leading to some very emotional farewells not long after. As the two friends part ways, they implore each other not to forget each other. Till we meet again, Sarah, he says, before the TARDIS dematerialises. It's fairly safe to say that this was meant literally, though there really isn't a time limit on that. Nor, in fact, does time move normally for a Time Lord with a TARDIS. It also seems that the TARDIS prevented their reunion, as on his next trip to London he ends up at the wrong location, and then gains a new companion. This may be somewhat of a stretch to include this. Perhaps this should be marked as an unintentional lie that the Doctor told, though it did cause poor Sarah Jane years of fear and doubt. Number 8. How old is the Doctor? River Song said it best. The Doctor lies. Knowing that this is rule number one of travelling with the Time Lord, the Doctor lies. So, trying to assess the Doctor's age is a bafflingly immense task, especially as the Doctor themselves have been incredibly inconsistent in how they tell people their age. Putting aside the Timeless Child for a moment, the first Doctor was around 236 years old when he borrowed the TARDIS. This is supported when Romana says that the fourth Doctor had been travelling in the TARDIS for 523 years, when in the Rybos operation he was confirmed as 759 years old. However, when Idris and the TARDIS merged in the Doctor's wife, she says they've been travelling together for 700 years. At this point, the Doctor was around 909 years old, which would make him 209 when he stole the TARDIS. There are many more examples of this. Suffice it to say that the Doctor has never been 100% honest about his age, though he also suggests in The Day of the Doctor that he was told so many lies he truly doesn't remember how old he is anymore. River Song looked into the Doctor's eyes and called him a young man when he was 903. Between the time of the Doctor and some of the 12th Doctor's era, hundreds of years pass. Do you know what? How old is the Doctor? Old. The Doctor's old. Number 7. Breaking Ace's faith in him. In The Curse of Fenric, the Seventh Doctor and Ace go up against Fenric and the Ancient One, two incredibly powerful beings who seek to destroy everything. There is a catch during their final confrontation, Ace's unwavering belief in the Doctor's infallibility. This was an early adventure for her, so she saw the Doctor as a mentor and someone who is to be trusted absolutely. This presented a problem for the Doctor as her faith creates a barrier in the room that they are in, making the Ancient One powerless to act against Fenric. He devises a cruel yet effective way of dealing with this. Fenric threatens Ace's life, saying he will kill her if the Doctor doesn't give him what he needs. The Doctor answers, kill her. He proceeds to scoff about what a failure she is, that he would never normally take in a street kid like her, and that he was using her the whole time. This crushes her, breaking her walls down. The Ancient One moves forward and quickly, and the Doctor rushes her out, allowing the two other monsters to destroy each other. Though he does explain to her why he lied the way that he did, she's badly shaken by the experience. Number 6. You can save the other Amy. The Doctor will often tell lies to encourage people to do better than they've ever thought possible. Occasionally, he'll tell lies to boost morale. However, sometimes, he will lie because the truth is simply too harsh for the bearer to take. 
This is the case in The Girl Who Waited, a sixth season episode that saw the Doctor, Amy and Rory find themselves on Apalapachia, a planet that has two time streams. Amy gets lost in a time stream, resulting in Rory and the Doctor meeting her again many years later. She has been trapped, attempting to avoid the robots that stalk the facility trying to help people. This help comes in the form of a fatal injection. Though it's the least of the Doctor's worries, he knows instantly upon finding their Amy that two versions of the same companion cannot exist. He lies, telling Rory and the Amys that they can escape in the TARDIS together. However, at the last moment he locks the door on the older version while she screams outside. He turns to an enraged Rory and gives him the choice. As both Amys can't exist, he must pick which one should come with them. He chooses the younger Amy, leaving her older counterpart to be killed. It's a horribly grim ending to the episode, where no one seems to come out of it a winner. Number 5. Pulling a fast one on the family of blood. The oncoming storm. That's the name for the Doctor when he's at full strength and angry enough to live up to the namesake. During the events of Human Nature and the Family of Blood, the Doctor is reduced to human form, becoming the mild-mannered schoolteacher John Smith. This allows him to hide his Time Lord energy from the deadly family, though also dooms much of the English countryside to war. While as the Doctor, he might have been able to fix things a little earlier than he was able to, it takes the sacrifice of John Smith before he can see it through. It takes a lot of convincing, but the Doctor's human form finally accepts his fate, this allows the Time Lord to enact a cold victory over the family. He arrives on the ship, masking his scent from them, seemingly hitting buttons on board at random. Then, turning on a dime, he tells them that he has set the ship to self-destruct. It may seem like a small deception, but only then, fully revealed at last, does the Doctor reveal his greatest lie. He had never been running away to hide. He'd been running away out of mercy, hoping they would change their ways. The revenge that he enacts on the Family of Blood remains one of the darkest moments in the history of Doctor Who. Number 4. Clara never had control of the TARDIS keys. In Dark Water, Danny Pink is struck and killed by a passing car. While his death is slightly ignoble, it is the catalyst for a huge nightmare that the Doctor and Clara must face together. First of all though, the Doctor needs to see just how far Clara is willing to go to save the man she loves. She attempts to slip him a sleep patch so that she can casually steal all of the TARDIS keys and force him to take her to save Danny. She brings the TARDIS to a rocky outcrop over a river of lava. She tells him that she remembers something he told her. Only lava could destroy a TARDIS key. She methodically tosses them into the river, demanding he help her. He refuses again and again until finally she throws the last key away while they are both locked out. Only then does the Doctor reveal his ruse. He switched around, placing the sleep patch on her so that he could see how resolute she was. Though furious with her, he understands her motives completely and helps her to find Danny. However, they both find something they never truly expected at all. Number 3. Dooming Kleeg just to see what he's up to. The second Doctor, Jamie and Victoria arrive on the planet Telos and are quickly embroiled in some local nonsense. Initially, they go along with what's happening to play along, little realising that the deadly threat lies just beneath their feet. They meet Klee, Kaftan and Toberman, and a group of archaeologists. The group is dragged in as a member of the archaeology team is killed mere moments after they arrive, though they manage to convince the team that they had nothing to do with it. Then they discover the truth. The expedition has arrived to uncover the tomb of the Cybermen and, with it, gain all of their power. The Doctor has met these creatures before, so he is not keen on helping. However, there comes a moment when he's partnered with Klieg. Curiosity overtakes him and he pretends that he doesn't want the man to activate the tomb, spurring him to work harder. This results in the power being restored. With the return of the power comes the return of the Cybermen, the Cyber Controller and many Cybermats. All the Doctor had to do was nothing. Instead, these villains return, leading to several deaths. Number 2. Promising to help, just to steal back his key. Spearhead from Space is John Pertwee's first serial as the third Doctor, disorientated and stranded on planet Earth. He has just undergone a forced regeneration, with Patrick Troughton's second Doctor spinning off into oblivion at the hands of the Time Lords. His TARDIS is sent to Earth, now in full colour, though it is stripped of certain parts. The Doctor, however, is not aware of this. Collapsing after his arrival, he's taken to a hospital. There, he's quickly located by Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart and Dr Liz Shaw, though of course they don't recognise his face. Meanwhile, the nesting in consciousness and the Autons have begun an assault, meaning that if there was ever a need for the Doctor, it was then. The Time Lord awakens, seemingly very preoccupied with finding his shoes. He doesn't know that Unit has nicked the TARDIS key where he stashed them. Once he does discover this, his devious side emerges. He promises to help Shaw in fighting the alien threat, though he appears frustrated by the lack of technology available to him. He convinces her to steal back his TARDIS key, claiming that what he needs is a board. 
As soon as she hands it to him, he nips inside, slams the door, and it prepares to dematerialize. The Time Lords removed crucial parts of the TARDIS, leaving him stranded and deeply ashamed of his actions as he steps back outside to face Shaw. Number 1. Pretending the TARDIS was broken so he could investigate Scarrow. The first Doctor, played by William Hartnell, was a far cry from the lighter incarnations that would arrive around the 10th and 11th Doctors. In fact, this version of the Time Lord once told a lie so seemingly simple that brought him face to plunger with the greatest threat the galaxy has ever known. The Daleks of the second serial of Doctor Who, further deepening the discontent between the old Time Lord and his companions, Ian and Barbara. Together with Susan, they all land on a planet that contains a petrified forest. None of them realise that the planet is irradiated. Stepping outside, Susan is separated from the others, discovering a human hand. Meanwhile, Ian and Barbara are still adamant about returning home, though Barbara also begins to grow ill from radiation poisoning. They forcibly berate the Doctor until he begrudgingly agrees to bring them home. However, rather than comply, he sabotages the TARDIS, stating that only Mercury will fix it, with the only source of Mercury being inside the city that just happens to be the source of the Doctor's interest. This lie almost gets them all killed and makes the Daleks, the greatest enemy of the Doctor, aware of his existence for the first time. Whoops. That's everything for our list today. I'm sure there's been plenty of lies along the way, so if you reckon we've missed any, please drop it into the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and remember that you can catch us over on Twitter at WhoCulture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter as well. Whatever you do in the meantime, try and be honest, but if you have to lie, try not to end up face to plunger with a Dalek. Look after yourselves, keep things wibbly wobbly. Thanks guys! <laughs>